Welcome back everyone to the Advanced Blockchain Development Tutorials. It's time to talk about VRAM. Now, one of the reasons the Elemental Battles project, we don't deploy that to mainnet, is because of RAM costs. We store all this information about users and games and things like that. And uh, it would take an enormous amount of RAM in EOS in order to, to do that. Like the average tutorial taker can't afford the RAM it would take to deploy a simple card game. So VRAM is an alternative, decentralized, scalable, affordable storage solution. And uh, this lesson, we're gonna get into how to use VRAM in the next few lessons. But in this lesson, we'll just talk about some of the uh, various aspects of VRAM. Now, it's helpful to think, I actually wanna, I think, get myself off the screen here. It's helpful to think of a traditional computer in order to understand VRAM, right? Your computer you're using right now, or your phone you're using right now, has memory that's called RAM, random access memory. And it's very fast, like compared to a hard disk, compared to a flash drive, compared to a CD, it's much faster, but it's limited and expensive. You might have a two terabyte hard drive in your computer, but there's no way you have two terabytes of RAM. You have a limited amount maybe eight gigabytes of RAM. Hard disks, conversely, they're slower, yes, but they're cheap and they're virtually unlimited. You can go and buy a new hard disk, plug it into your computer. Even if you can't expand your computer physically, you have a laptop maybe, you have limited space, you can plug a drive into one of the USB ports and get some additional space that way. So disks are cheap, but also slower. There's this trade-off and the trade-off continues in both directions. A backup hard drive that you plug in might be slower still, but have more space. You know, you could even go down to things like tape drives, right? Uh, or other backup solutions that are slower including, by the way, online uh, cloud backup solutions. They're slower, but they have more space still. And uh, up at the top of the scale, up here, there are also more levels up here, where like, for instance, your CPU cache, your processor cache, very, very tiny amount of memory, like we're talking kilobytes, but it's much faster, much, much faster, and it's used to cache information the processor is working with right now. So this hierarchy, there are various other steps, various other complexities, but the main two components, I think, that we think about in this storage hierarchy are RAM and disks. Well, on EOS, yes, you have RAM. The block producers have RAM in their machines, and that RAM is available for use by applications. The DAP network adds VRAM as a technology that is analogous to hard disks, uh, but it's impractical for apps to keep everything in RAM, even though that's what they've been doing. And some applications have needed to basically maintain vigorous pruning strategies in order to survive in RAM or make the users pay for RAM whenever the users take actions, which is another common strategy. But RAM, again, here is faster, but it's limited. There's, I think, 128 gigabytes, maybe a little bit more because it's increasing over time and uh, it's expensive. And that's a, that sounds like a lot, 128 gigabytes. It's a very small amount for the total storage of all the applications running on EOS and all the users and all the games and all the interactions going on. VRAM is a little bit slower. There's a latency to warm up information from VRAM into RAM so that it can be used, but it's, cheap by comparison, and uh, I think it's actually cheap, as I'll name some numbers from a Coindesk article later, and it's virtually, potentially, unlimited. Now, with our traditional computer and its RAM and disks, the RAM is used to cache data. We're not storing data in RAM, right? The data is stored on disks, but it's cached in RAM when we're working with it. If you're viewing a video, you're editing a file, you're running a program, that active data is cached in RAM so that since we're gonna need it right now and we know we're gonna need it in, in the near future, right? It's available for quick access. Meanwhile, disks hold data for long-term use. There's also virtual memory that where a portion of the disk is allocated to act as RAM. So again, it's more complicated than I'm presenting it as. But the basic idea is that you use faster levels of the storage hierarchy, faster tiers, to cache data from slower tiers. 
So that's exactly what we're doing from a development perspective. RAM is caching data as it's supposed to, and VRAM is holding the data. Now, that might sound more centralized. We'll get to that in a moment because it's not. But from a development perspective, the VRAM is like the hard disk. It holds the data at cheap storage, long-term use. And whenever you need that, say a user logs in or a game begins or continues or whatever, the data is warmed up into RAM for fast use. Now, there's actually another layer here in this hierarchy, and that's the blockchain. The blockchain records everything that has ever been in RAM or, by extension, VRAM. It's all recorded in the blockchain. In fact, the blockchain is little more than a record of all the changes in RAM, right? We're talking about a state machine where the current state is the RAM and changes in state are recorded in the blockchain. So if we look at these two layers, VRAM is faster than going through the blockchain to figure out all of the old data. If you're gonna try to figure out what was in RAM at a certain point, you normally have to play through the blockchain or use some other solution. But VRAM is faster because that information is cached by DAP service providers. The blockchain you can get data from, you can see what was in RAM previously, uh, but you'd have to replay through the history. But the blockchain, of course, has the advantage of being stored by everyone, which we'll get to in a second. So while from a development perspective, you're caching data in RAM and storing it, holding it, in VRAM. From a decentralization perspective, the VRAM is caching data from the blockchain. So you still have all your data in an immutable ledger. It's just much more accessible now in VRAM. You don't have to hold it in RAM all the time in order to keep it accessible because VRAM will cache the data for you so that you can warm it up into RAM quickly, not have to replay through the blockchain or use some other expensive history solution. And because it's held in the blockchain, you still have assurances against its manipulation, against its loss. First, everything, like I said, is preserved on chain. It can't be lost if DAP service providers go down. Let's say all the DAP service providers, the entire DAP network is, I don't know, it explodes tomorrow. None of the data that's held in VRAM is actually lost because it is all preserved on chain. It could be replayed. In fact, uh, tests have been done where it has been replayed successfully and restored in a short amount of time. So all the data is not losable, even if the DAP network falls apart or there's some other kind of problem. You also have assurance that the data is not tampered with while it's cached in VRAM, right? The DAP service providers are storing it for you, but they cannot tamper with it. And I'm gonna pull up another slide to show why that is. Here's a little kind of a quick graph of what happens to some data. The user's logged in, let's say he's logged into our card game and he's playing a game right now. So there's active data, it's kept in RAM so that it responds as quickly as possible. And since it's kept in RAM, Every change in that state is recorded on chain. All the data about the game is recorded on chain. Now, a cryptographic footprint is left in RAM. If the user, let's say the user uh, is idle for a few minutes and we determine that this user's data doesn't need to be in RAM anymore because the user is gone. Well, a cryptographic footprint of the data is left in RAM that proves the data. It's a hash of the data, it's a Merkle root. And the data is then evicted to VRAM. So it's no longer taking up precious, expensive RAM space. It's now in VRAM. So it's being held by the DAP service providers and ready to be warmed up back into RAM when needed. But when it's warmed back up, it automatically checks with this cryptographic footprint, the Merkle root that's left in RAM, in order to ensure that the data was not tampered with. So the footprint and the history both remain even though the data has been evicted to VRAM, which means you are assured not only that the data can't be lost, but you're assured that the data cannot be tampered with because it's when it's warmed up again to be used, it has to be warmed up into RAM in order to be used by a smart contract. When it's warmed up again into RAM, it's verified against this cryptographic footprint. So you have those two assurances. And then furthermore, you can also use multiple DSPs for redundancy. Obviously you don't want to have your storage system fail and you've got to replay the chain and you don't want to 
detect that the data has been tampered with. And so you have to replay the chain in order to figure out what the untampered data was. So you can use multiple DAP service providers in order to obtain extra redundancy. Now, from a developer's perspective, this might seem a little difficult to implement, but one of the things the DAP network does is try to make everything as seamless as possible. In fact, it tries to make DAP network services act and seem like they are native EOS features. So VRAM is just a drop-in solution. You drop in a DAP multi-index table as if it were just a normal EOS multi-index table. And all these things, these complexities that I've talked about are handled in a way that the developer doesn't need to worry about with every use of RAM and VRAM. Uh, it can, in other words, it can be used in contracts as if it's an EOS feature. If you want to learn more about how this works, there's an old video I did before I was with Liquid Apps, before the first developer course came out, that uh, I will link in the, in the notes. But basically, uh, exceptions, errors, are used as signals. So you use this DAP multi-index table in your smart contract, right? And that throws an error because EOS has no idea. EOS IO has no idea what a DAP multi-index table is. But that error is picked up on by your DAP service providers as a feature request. And then the DAP service providers supply the feature that's needed. And then, then EOS IO processes what you're trying to do. So it's, I think, a brilliant way. I didn't come up with it. Uh, Tal Muscal, our CTO at Liquid Apps did. It's a brilliant way to add new features to EOS without requiring changes in EOS. And uh, furthermore, VRAM is cheap, especially if rented. Uh, one of the examples, the Moonlighting Corporation, it's a freelancer gig economy app. They have about 750,000 users and they're pushing, uh, this is an old number, there might be more. They're pushing thousands and thousands of transactions daily. Now, uh, according to a recent Coindesk article, on RAM that would have cost about $2,000 a day. But by using Rex for other resources and by using VRAM, Moonlighting pays $10 a day instead. So it saves a bunch of costs and you don't even have to stake DAP to a DSP. You can rent it through a rental market. There are two as of this video, Chintai and Blockstart are both running rental markets. So VRAM is much cheaper to use than RAM. These are excellent reasons to use VRAM and it's a decentralized, scalable, affordable storage solution. That's why we're jumping in to learn how to use VRAM in our smart contracts. I'll see you in the next lesson.